Well, I don't know if I'm, I'm going to be trying to convince you that uh, I've done more work here than I really have done or trying to convince you that you have less work to do than you really have to do. <laughs> but whatever the event, it may be neither. I've I've taken chapter four, really, and I've split this into two separate lectures, mainly just so you don't have one really long lecture. As there just are a number of slides from this chapter. There's a lot of material in here when you start talking about discrimination in American society. I suppose that's not much of a surprise to you. Um, so the first part, really, um, the, the first several slides that we're going to talk about then relate to uh, the various uh, racial and ethnic groups that have immigrated or emigrated to America um, and and who constitute the largest portion of our of our racial minorities. Now when we talk about discrimination there's all sorts of dis types of discrimination and and not only in the United States of course it exists all over the globe. There are those who say that a member of any group sees their own group as superior to other groups. You know, that we all have our theories of superiority and inferiority and exceptionalism. And so the United States and white culture, the white majority, certainly isn't um, the exception to the rule. Uh, discrimination and racism and all these isms exists everywhere. But um, when we look at it in, in particular, in our own society, it appears to be much greater than in many places around the globe in many respects. Um, there, just we discriminate. Actually, you know, the United States was um, at least originally was, um, I believe, one of the first places, the only place that ever based slavery upon race. Slavery was usually the result of war or had something to do with economic servitude, but it never had anything to do with race until until the colonists instituted uh, uh, race as a basis for slavery and 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 really since that time the whole racial issue has been a major major one in the united states now race of course is a biological um, well it isn't actually a biological i mean to say factor it, it's it's a social factor really um, because there, there isn't really any such thing as uh, a pure race. That's one of those myths about race that we have. Um, but really, uh, what we're often talking about, when we talk about race is skin color. And, and uh, so that's where the, the inclusion of the term colorism comes into play here. Um, but in general, we'll just refer to it as, as racial discrimination. And other forms of discrimination are based on things such as gender, sexual orientation, age, disability, religion, and on down the list here that you see. Now, for the purposes of this particular lecture, this, this chapter covers the first five groups, that is race, gender, sexual orientation, age, and disability. And the others are not really addressed in, in this particular chapter, but um, some of them are, you know, uh, sort of uh, cross sections you know when we when we talk about discrimination remember the concept of intersectionality particularly as it applies um, as we go through the these five categories in in these two lectures this week that belonging to one of these groups one of these minority groups makes you subject to discrimination and and can you know can create a lot of handicaps for you in in um, in your existence when you belong to more than one group or two or three or more groups uh, the the uh, the power of the discrimination becomes even even greater so just uh, something to keep in mind as we go through this talk now there's a lot of discussion about what causes discrimination and uh, one thing i want to mention first of all one of those little basic sociological rules of thumb that we used to talk or talk about in, in, in 101 was that because somebody is prejudiced um, doesn't mean that they're going to discriminate net by necessity and if one discriminates that doesn't necessarily mean by necessity that they're prejudiced and by that it's possible for instance for you to belong to a group and to not necessarily hold prejudicial attitudes towards um, somebody in the in an out group and yet when that group acts to discriminate against the members of the out group and and you do not speak up as a member of that out group it could be said that you while you don't hold prejudice you nonetheless contribute to discrimination likewise uh, some persons who um, hold particular prejudices have enough sense about them not to actually engage in discrimination um, 
in, in, in a kind of a behavioral sense. But setting that beyond that particular theory, that particular thought, there are some theories about what, what uh, underlies discrimination. One is um, the, a psychological theory that suggests that people are frustrated with their station in life, perhaps economically speaking or socially speaking. They're not happy with, with how their life has turned out and are very frustrated about that. And so uh, d wind up directing their aggression at substitute targets, something that they can blame for their condition. Uh, and so they select relatively weak minority targets for their anger. That's, that's the fr frustration aggression theory. Um, other socioeconomic and social groups appear lower in standing. And so, for instance, poor whites, um, which, you know, may be the particular group that most of us have in mind when we start thinking about discrimination. Um, they may feel better about their own standing uh, as they compare themselves to persons of a lower station of life. The normative cultural theory about discrimination holds that prejudice uh, is taught. Discrimination thus is taught, um, that it grows from our socialization and um, those in, in, in any particular group then are rewarded for adopting the prevailing attitudes and behaviors of that group, prejudice and discrimination. This kind of goes back a little bit to uh, Sutherland's theory of uh, differential association that we uh, talked about in a previous lecture, uh, where, where we learn deviant kinds of behaviors and deviant um, attitudes uh, just the same way we learn to, to have positive attitudes and conforming behaviors. And finally, the economic theory holds that the, the group, the dominant group, economically speaking, um, fashions the laws and enforces those laws such that it discriminates against other groups in, in order to maintain the dominant group's power and uh, political standing. So, and in many respects, one way they go about doing this is by pitting marginalized groups against each other um, to keep to keep um, their power you know, in in place and. You know, I, as I observe uh, the, uh, have observed the interactions during the Trump administration, you know, the political interactions where the left and the right uh, uh, are arguing constantly with each other in Congress and in social media and on the news and, and different kinds of things. Really, do you see how the left and the right are pitted against each other in our society? And, and meanwhile, while all that's going on, there are those who believe that the powers to be, whether it be in the Trump administration or other uh, more uh, malevolent and you know, background kinds of forces are at work carrying out their own, their own uh, agenda while we fight among ourselves. So that's, uh, that, that would be the economic theory uh, about you know, pitting marginalized groups against each other. And that also can be done in economic sense as well. In order to justify itself, uh, prejudices and discrimination usually um, take on a kind of a moral or theological air of support for, for themselves. For instance, some would hold that um, the Bible says that um, men should be the leader of their home, you know, kind of reinforcing patriarchy and thus justifying discrimination against women in many different settings. Um, other uh, Some, th some uh, religious religions teach that homosexuality is a sin and so that justifies homophobia and and the practice of discrimination against the LGBTQ population. So sometimes the, the and these these kind of moral arguments then become ones that are very difficult, if not impossible, to dislodge from the thinking of those individuals who hold these beliefs. Also, uh, and again, we've talked about this uh, in previous lectures, some bogus science, science theories at times um, provides a, sort of a pseudo proof to support theories of inferiority. You know, eugenics being one of those theories that uh, Adolf Hitler used in, uh, in the years leading up to World War II to justify the extermination of the Jews. And the Jews were just the beginning of his plan, but that's as far as he got. So racism involves a discrimination against racially different minority groups that result in prejudicial treatment. And, and you see racism um, rear its ugly head in, in areas of employment practices, transportation services, housing policies, law enforcement and judicial enforcement, media portrayals, and, and, and 
educational practices and so on. Institutional racism uh, differs from from um, from say individual racism and 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 this is something that's important I think um, at least until um, more recent years after the after the civil rights era I believe most individuals recognize that the portrayal of individual racism and individual discrimination was not acceptable. Most people look down upon that and in most elements of our society at least and and uh, individual acts of discrimination became less uh, less apparent and less frequent. Again, I would say until you know the, the last uh, well you know the, the last five or ten years perhaps but but um, institutional racism, institutional discrimination has continued during that time and it's a much more subtle process where where uh, racist uh, uh, behaviors and attitudes are woven into the practices of institution that uh, it really becomes very entrenched and embedded in a society to the point where it's almost invisible to the majority. Uh, although uh, members of the minority will tell you that it's that it is uh, never so invisible to them. Uh, you know, I would point to uh, my, one of my favorite illustrations of this of this concept is uh, Peggy McIntosh's article on the knapsack of privilege, you know, white privilege, uh, and all of the little ways now this uh, the this society supports white privilege in, in just very subtle ways that seem perhaps unimportant to those of us in the majority and and even to many people in the minority uh, many of those little points seem seem unimportant and yet taken as a whole they they um, they're quite a different matter and they become much more important in 2008 when Barack Obama was running for president he argued that he believed that uh, his race wasn't going to matter in in the election that he um, wasn't running as a black candidate he was he was because he believed that um, we were living in a post-racial society now uh, I think the events that have occurred since his first election and his subsequent re-election uh, have demonstrated anything but that uh, and I'm not sure that he would say we live in a post-racial society any longer and certainly with uh, some of the events that we're going to talk about a little bit later on here um, you know you can see that race has once again even individual acts of, of racial discrimination have become much more prominent once again in our you know, in our um, social discourse and sometimes if we uh, well and one other issue here one other thing I want to say is that this belief that uh, um, we should be colorblind in our society that we shouldn't consider matters of race that we should um, you know that we shouldn't consider race to be important uh, what it does uh, in effect is is that it allows the majority the dominant majority to maintain the status quo in other words if we say we live in a colorblind society um, then um, that means that we don't have to change anything. And, and uh, again, members of the racial minorities would tell you that's really not at all the, the case. And so we have to be careful about saying that, that we desire a colorblind existence in our, in our society. We, we need to be aware of race and we need to recognize the handicaps that it causes and, and correct those handicaps. Now, if, if sometimes we don't recognize the, the, the presence of, of um, discrimination, statistics have a way of, of kind of helping clarify things. And, and while you can manipulate statistics, statistics really are a much more truthful kind of neutral way of looking at things that, that can illustrate what's going on in our society, even though we may have convinced ourselves that other facts are true. For instance, consider the poverty among African Americans that is rising. In 2010, 41% of African American households that were headed by a single female lived below the poverty line. Almost half. That's well, four out of ten. Um, the um, in 2014, the, the median household income for an African American family was 59% of the median household income for a white family. 
in 2012, the, pov the black poverty rate had been falling on t uh, 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 up until, I think, 2012, when it was at 22.7%, but it's risen since that time. Uh, at this time, it, uh, nationally, the poverty rate for African-American households, or at least in 2015, was 27% nationally. But if you look at, at various pockets around the United States, and the text uh, mentions Arkansas and the District of Columbia, uh, the poverty rate is high as 36%, over one in three. Uh, for and, and meanwhile, the poverty rate nationally for white non-Hispanic families is 10%. The black unemployment rate is more than twice that of, of, of the white unemployment rate. And and um, something perhaps a little counterintuitively, you would think that the more education um, an individual gets, the, the, the less unemployment is an issue, but uh, or income becomes greater. And while it is true that, um, that um, higher education does raise your income potential overall and raise your, your uh, net worth, uh, it's not so true for African Americans, um, and in fact, the higher the educational level between whites, uh, uh, the greater the income gap becomes between whites and blacks, and that's illustrated uh, very well by the um, Table 4.1 in, in in the text. If you want to take a look at it, but uh, between 1992 and 2013, over that 20-year period, the median net worth for blacks with college degrees went down 56%. But for whites, it rose 86%. Now, there, that's something very telling. And what explains that? Well, there are some explanations that suggest that uh, the public sector jobs, which were, I guess, traditionally filled by Afri many, or at least many African-American men were employed in public sector jobs. Uh, many of those have been lost uh, over the last uh, few decades. And, and the population as a whole uh, has not really moved on to um, being hired in managerial and supervisory positions since that time. If you're African, there's a, if you uh, haven't ever read this article, uh, you might want to Google driving while black and um, take a look at uh, a very interesting study. Now, this is an older study now, but in um, 10, 15 years back in the New Jersey Turnpike, they they uh, did an analysis of people that were stopped by by uh, New Jersey State Troopers on the on the um, Garden State Parkway, their their turnpike, and found that uh, if you were black, you're I forget the percentage, the odds of you being stopped, but were much much higher than if you were white, even if you weren't breaking the speed limit. Um, if you're black and you commit a crime. Uh, or you're breaking the law, the odds of you being caught or stopped by the police are greater than if you're white. If you're stopped by the police, the odds of being arrested, charged with a crime, are greater if you're black than if you're white. And if you're charged with a crime, the odds of you being jailed are greater if you're black than if you're white. And if you're jailed, the odds of you getting out on bail are lower than if you that if you're black than if you're white. If you are, and then we know that people that are actually in jail um, at the time of their trial are more likely to be convicted, and so your odds of being convicted are greater. And if convicted of a major felony, um, you know, they could put you on death row. The odds of being sent to death row are greater if you're black than if you're white. There's some pretty clear indications in those statistics. That comes from some old sociological studies that I that I uh, t uh, taught from some years back you know that pretty serious uh, indications there of, of uh, the fact that our, st our society is anything but but uh, colorblind your lifetime likelihood of as a black person of going to state or federal prison is twice that than if you're Hispanic and five times that if you're white about one in three black males will enter state or federal prisons at some time during their lifetime. And uh, of the persons on death row, 42% are, are African American, even though in the general population in the United States, they represent only 13%. The, and statistics, the statistics as far as victimization goes are equally harsh. For blacks, uh, they're four times more likely to be murdered than white. Um, the uh, young males, 20 to 24, have the highest homicide rates. Um, 
and the black male homicide rate is 32 per 100,000 as opposed to 4 per 100,000 for whites. The Black Lives Matter movement actually began after the Trayvon Martin shooting, actually after George Zimmerman was acquitted of, of, um, of uh, murder charges and Trayvon Martin killing in Sanford in uh, Florida in, I believe, 2012. And, and um, uh, really, th this movement uh, got up steam in the, the dealing with the string of deaths since that time, Michael Brown in Ferguson and and uh, Tamir Rice in Cleveland and Eric Garner in New York. And, you know, there's a long list of, and actually the book has a long list of those names of individuals who, black men, and mostly some black women also, who were murdered by or, or shot by uh, white on-duty officers, um, apparently unnecessarily. That at least has been the, the conclusion, although uh, grand juries have indicted some and not convicted them, but uh, in other places they have been convicted. And so this is, really kind of drawn attention to the fact that, again, you know, the the, uh, the law enforcement system in America uh, may be overreactive to particularly young black males. Uh, even uh, even the president of the United States, uh, Barack Obama, said that as a, if he had a son, he would talk with him about how he, he had to comport himself in the, in the community, uh, what to do if, if a black, if a police officer stopped him, how to act and, and those kinds of things. Uh, it's a real fear among the among the African American community. There, housing is another area where um, there's a gulf between the races. Uh, minority households are more likely to be poor than white households, and so they they're likely more likely to be renters. And those that do buy often buy homes on very unfavorable, maybe predatory kinds of uh, terms that make them a good candidate for foreclosure at some point. There has been a practice in the real estate industry and also with some bank lending practices called redlining, where loans are granted or houses are sold only in certain areas of the community and not in, uh, in other areas. Um, and uh, there, there are some very interesting studies about that if you want to look at different step strategies and tactics that have been used um, essentially to, to uh, create segregated neighborhoods. The health statistics um, also demonstrate some of the um, effects of being African American are very hard on, on uh, well, for instance, the black infant mortality rate, 11.1 per 1,000 live births. For whites, it's less than half of that. Um, their African American children also, 13% of African American births uh, are of a low birth weight versus 8% in the general population, and low birth weight is a major factor in, in the death of children in their first year. Twice the sudden infant death syndrome mortality rate as, as white babies. The um, HIV rate is seven times higher among black men than white men, and interestingly, for black females, almost 20 times that of white females. Life expectancy is five years shorter for both black males and black females as compared to their their white uh, coordinates. High school graduation rates have actually kind of evened out among African American and white students in the United States. So there's about an equal number of, of both groups that are graduating now, but um, college completion rates are quite different. And, and um, as you can see, it's a 41% versus 22% uh, for a, a, a young persons age 25 and older with a bachelor's degree. Now, college degree correlates strongly with higher income. And so in the long run, this suggests uh, a negative impact on African-American economic standing in, in society as a whole, if this doesn't change at all. Um, if you read, if you have read the article by Jonathan Kozel, I have in previous semesters, if you've taken a class with me, you've probably read that. And if you haven't, I think I may have even, perhaps I've even assigned it this semester again, but uh, it's a classic study about the uh, comparing a, um, a low income high school in East St. Louis versus a, um, an upper middle class uh, uh, high school in, in uh, on Long Island and, and the different kinds of resources that are available to them and the problems that the two schools face separate and apart from the education program itself. And um, it's a very striking example of, 
of why it is that um, you know that we say that the individuals growing up in, in um, low socioeconomic neighborhoods don't have an equal chance at advancing in our society and that's it's a great that study is a great example of that so I think it's pretty clear that the, inst the institutional differences in the educational programs in the poor areas will impact uh, minorities and their ability to go on to higher education and higher degrees much more greatly than whites. It's also possible that the standards for high school graduation, I, you know, I'm not sure about this, but I, I wonder if the, if the standards for graduation also might differ or the quality of the education, even as um, the poorer students get um, a high school diploma if the quality of the education is the same as it would be if among the higher socioeconomic groups. And if you read Kozel's article, it's fairly clear that it would be very different. And, and likewise, about 11% of African-American households received more than half of their total family income from public assistance programs. And that just compares to something under 3% for non-Hispanic white households. Now we'll move on to um, the Hispanic American population. And this is now the largest minority group in the United States and um, is projected to become about a quarter of the United States population by uh, 2050. This uh, is the source of much gnashing and gnawing of teeth among, among those uh, persons who are mired in the desire for the white northern European race to continue to be the majority in the United States. And by by uh, by 2050 or thereabouts, uh, whites will no longer be the majority in the United States, northern European whites. Now, that does not mean that they will be a minority. They're still going to be the majority. And mind you, setting aside numbers, how, how many individuals are, of course, majority and minority really is much more dependent upon dependent upon who's in power, who gets elected, who's running the businesses and corporations, who has the money. And, and it's safe to say that that's going to continue to rest with the white Northern European establishment uh, long after 2050. But in any event, uh, by, by sheer numbers, um, white Northern European heritage may uh, will at some point around the mid-century no longer be more than 50% of the population. But still be the largest group in the United States. Why we worry about that, I don't know, because, you know, diversity brings a richness to our lives that, uh, well, just a lot of people don't appreciate that and feel very threatened by it be for some reason. But more than half of the total population increased from, uh, well, the first decade of, of this century was, was accounted for by, by Hispanics. The um, group as a whole has a lot of great diversity, and this is true actually for all of the groups, even including uh, white, white Americans. There's a lot of diversity within that. So that when you talk, for instance, about whites, you know, and you're talking about Italian Americans or Irish Americans or Hungarian Americans or German Americans, Northerns versus Southerners, rural versus urban, um, et cetera, et cetera. These are all considered white people and but their cultures and their actually their histories really and sometimes are very very different and and so even even when you talk about white americans you know we're lumping in a, a quite a bit of a diversity in that group when we talk about about um, our minorities including african americans hispanics and asian americans and native americans there are many many diverse groups within subgroups within this larger group that we that we talk about and so take keep that in mind that when we talk about these statistics you know we're really talking about broad very broad terms but the text indicates that uh, there are 22 different countries represented in the overall group of Hispanic Americans, uh, the largest groups being Mexico, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Caribbean nations in South and Central America. Um, and, and then also you have the Hispanic Americans that were born and raised in the United States. The, uh, now, much of the focus when we talk about uh, Latinos, Hispanic Americans, uh, in recent years has been upon un undocumented workers in the United States and the estimates the number of undocumented workers in the United States and, and th these are only estimates of course but uh, most of these come from Spanish speaking nations not all of them but, but there's about 11.3 million of those and about half of them are, are Mexican. <laughs> 
but each of these subgroups of Latino cultures have very distinct social and cultural backgrounds, have little in common historically with each other. And, and so uh, you'll find differences in these groups in their income and in their culture and their, and, and their expectations. Incidentally, about undocumented workers, you know, studies also show that, uh, as we're going to touch on here in a moment, that they, t they, they don't take jobs from American workers that American workers want. They take jobs usually that American workers don't want. And, and the farm workers who are paid far less than they would if they were um, union workers, let's say, for instance, you know, that were, you know, naturalized or natural born citizens. Um, the fact that they're working for much lower wages is one of the reasons why the United States has some of the lowest food prices in the world and, and, and a steady supply of food as well. That if indeed, um, if, if uh, one has a goal of getting all the undocumented um, uh, workers, undocumented persons out of the United States and back to the country of origin and, and uh, so that nobody is here that, that uh, isn't legally supposed to be here. Uh, one thing that we would see is a great sh uh, jump in, in, uh, in our food prices and, and uh, our economy would have quite a shock. And so the, uh, aside from the fact that the undocumented workers are also paying taxes as well while they're working, uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we, we don't want to have them all sent home again. About 26, 27 percent of the larger Hispanic group live below the poverty line. It's just slightly less than African American poverty rate, but but roughly similar. The median income, 42,000, about 42 and a half thousand in, in 2014, is about 18,000 less than it is for for uh, white households and and something like 10 or 11,000 less than it is for the general population, uh, the aggregate population. About 14% of Hispanics between 18 and 25 did not have a high school diploma, and significantly only 8% of Mexican Americans had earned a college degree. Again, keep in mind the uh, the value added nature of of um, of higher education and and the degrees that you get. It, you know, in the long run, what this is going to mean in terms of uh, you know their ability to uh, be productive and to to get ahead in American society. Now, Hispanic businesses are growing at a, at a rate much faster than uh, all the other U.S. firms are growing, and and contributed something like six hundred billion dollars to the U.S. economy in twenty fifteen. So this is a, a very important segment of our population for our economy, but but still the economic indicators that perhaps because of the issues about education, among other things, you know, suggest that uh, that the economic picture for the group as a whole is pretty is pretty dim, especially for Mexican American and Puerto Rican populations. Now it's it's kind of interesting because I I read and reread the the uh, paragraph in the text about uh, the growth of Mexican Americans in the United States and and I swear the beginning and the end say uh, very different things and and I kept reading it over and over again to see if I was misinterpreting how it was written but at one point it said that Mexican Americans constituted about sixty seven percent of of Hispanics in the United States um, at another point. It said 75% in the same paragraph. Um, so I, I went online and actually I, I, I think I got this off of Wikipedia, which isn't the greatest authority, but uh, uh, the, the reference that I found there said that 62% of all Hispanics in the United States in 2017 were Mexican Americans. Somewhere between two thirds and three quarters, I guess you could say. Now we turn to uh, American Indian Alaska Native population. There are well over 300 uh, tribes, uh, recognized federally recognized tribes in the United States, and and including the the uh, 250 some, 260 some tribes in Alaska as well. But and as with these other groups, again, there there is no one definition for Native American, American Indian, whatever you prefer to call the group Native Alaskan, uh, there's just no one single definition that will suffice or describe the group well. The, the um, Bureau of Indian Affairs, the federal agency that um, has a responsibility, I guess, to oversee uh, 
the livelihood, the services, and and um, and such for for the Native American population defines an American Indian as being a member of a recognized tribe that has one fourth or more of Native American blood. Now tribes have to apply actually to to the federal government in order to be recognized. One quarter or more quantum of Native American blood to be recognized as an American Indian. Now, some of the Alaska Native tribes have their own definitions of tribal membership, and sometimes it's the quantum of blood. Uh, sometimes it has to do with uh, where you live. You know, if uh, like I believe, at least uh, when I last was in Alaska, you know, the, the Nanilchik tribe recognized any uh, any uh, N Native American living in their region as being a member of their tribe if they wanted to sign up for their tribe. They didn't have to, you know, have a quantum of blood with a heritage in that particular tribe. The Census Bureau just looks to self-definition. And and this is an issue I have read in, in, in other, um, other textbooks, you know, that suggests that there are some problems there because of the, historically speaking, natives have been uh, Native Americans have been described in very derisive terms, um, referred to as savages and drunkards and those kinds of things. And a lot of the, uh, so I have read a lot of Native Americans who live out in the general communities in the cities away from the reservations don't identify themselves as Native Americans because they're, well, they're reluctant to do that. They, they want to be seen as a member of the mainstream. So they call themselves Caucasian. And, um, this hurts services for Native Americans because, um, you know, the kind of funding oftentimes is dependent upon the number of individuals in any particular group. And so uh, the, the article that I read suggested that the numbers of Native Americans uh, probably, based upon census figures at least, is probably a, a, a pretty gross underestimate of of what the true population is. But uh, 2013, the uh, American Indian and Alaska Native population combined was estimated to be about 5.2 million, or about 2% of the total United States population. And the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs indicated that about half that group lived on or near a reservation. I believe in Alaska, the only reservation is Metlakatna, although all the other villages uh, are recognized tribes. Uh, but uh, there's only one reservation per se in in Alaska. But in the lower 48, uh, those reservations exist, and and um, state regulations don't uh, don't apply within the reservation. The reservations have their own laws and and uh, their own child protection and that kind of thing. So it's quite a quite a difference in how and and that is the source of and I refer to this somewhere else here in these slides. This is sort of some contention in. In Alaska, the relationship between state government and tribal governments, and that's still evolving and was evolving when I moved there and was a constant source of discussion in child welfare areas. I know that since I've left that there have been some big steps taken to turn over some responsibilities in child welfare to the to the local tribes. Um, funding may be an issue for a lot of that, uh, but uh, I know that they've been working through some of those issues, at least in the last administration. Now the oppression of this group is, is there's a just a gigantic history of oppression, hardship, deprivation, uh, relocation, genocide, all of this throughout the history. Treaties made, treaties broken. Um, one Native American I know said that there that every treaty that the American government, the federal government, ever made with any of the First Nations tribes and American Indian tribes, uh, none of them were ever honored in the end. So. Depending upon, this is an important statistic here, you know, the, the text says, I think, between uh, first contact, which is, you know, when, when Columbus landed, they call it the pre-Columbian era. Um, the text said that the estimates of population in, in the, in, uh, of American Indians was somewhere between one and seven million. Now, I'm guessing they're referring to U.S. lands only, you know, but if you, if you look this up and you do some reading, you know, there are, um, most estimates put the number of, of Native Americans at the time of first contact at being something more like 57 million, but that uh, includes South America, Central America, Canada, United States, all, you know, that whole area. Um, nonetheless, um, even at 7 million, and 7 million is probably a, 
an underestimate, you know, could very well be an underestimate. Um, as the result of disease, and warfare, genocide policies, exploitation, uh, and so on, by 1880, one quarter of a million, 250,000 American Indians were counted in the United States population. Even if you take the low number of one million at the time of first contact, that means that uh, what three quarters of the of uh, of the American of the American Indian population uh, over the course of the about 400 years of white settlement in America were decimated. That's uh, when you look at at the other numbers. You know some of those numbers that tell you that it's far worse than the number of uh, deaths in the Holocaust. And, and yet, this is not something we really hear about in, in our American history books. And it's just something that I think is a very important part of our history that, that we need to be aware of. There, there were reports of, of deliberate spreading of, mal, of smallpox infested blankets by British settlers or, or British soldiers and American troops. Um, taking the blankets from smallpox treatment facilities and giving them to Indians and in, with an intention of, of, um, of decimating the population, of eradicating the, the savages, so to speak. And, uh, and, and, and uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the head of the BIA, formally apologized uh, for, for the BIA's participation in what they referred to as ethnic cleansing of Western tribes in September of 2000. some of those statistics that I tell you that speak the truth. 770% um, American Indians and Alaska Natives, 770% more likely to die from alcoholism. 650%, that's six and a half times as likely to die from tuberculosis. 420% more likely to die from diabetes. 350% more likely to die from suicide. That's 3.5 3 times the rate of the general population. And this is an interesting uh, aside here that in 2014, suicide was the second leading cause of death for Alaskan Native and American Indian persons aged 10 to 34, young persons. And among females ages 15 to 19, rates of completed suicide were almost four times higher than white female counterparts. I've read uh, similar statistics for the Alaska Native males um, uh, I know in the 1990s at least, and I suspect it's still uh, quite close to that, somewhere four to five times the rate of, of the white male suicide rate for the same age group in the lower 48. 280% um, more likely to die from accidents, 52% more likely to die from pneumonia and influenza. The life expectancy of an American Indian and Alaska Native individual is about four and a half years less or lower than the average for the United States. Children and adolescents of this group have the highest rates of lifetime major depressive episodes and have the highest reported self-reported depression rates of any eth ethnic or racial group in the United States. And once again, the poverty rate is something near 27% is among the highest in the nation, if not the highest in the United States. The conditions on reservations, um, are by, from what, at least from what I have uh, been aware, are, are pretty, uh, pretty oppressive. And, and uh, there have been a lot of complaints that the BIA and the federal government really have neglected the needs of this population. Now, by, by, by federal law, the recognized tribes are sovereign nations, but the extent of self-control, as I say here, is the source of some contention in Alaska is, is between the state government and, and the village governments. One thing that has happened economically is the, the gaming operations, the casinos and things that have become a source of revenue for some tribes, but have also brought a good deal of crime into their area as well and, and some problems with finances in addition to that. One big piece of federal legislation in 1978, the Indian Child Welfare Act, uh, ICWA, was enacted during the Jimmy Carter administration and it was intended to reduce uh, abuses by, well, essentially white social workers going into native homes and deciding that they weren't living up to, you know, proper standards of, of society, that is, white middle class society, in raising their kids. And so native children, American Indian children, being removed from their families because uh, the, the parenting practices uh, 
um, weren't up to par as far as white middle class values were concerned. And and uh, these children were taken away from their homes and, and their culture and oftentimes placed with white families. Uh, and, and um, that you know, even if they're eventually returned to their own uh, birth families, and many were not, um, it creates all sorts of psychological problems for the children later on as they grow older. And so ICWA, for one thing, establishes a, a, a system of uh, priorities for, for placement. And uh, the first priority is, is placement uh, with a member of that child's, well, first of all, the first priority is for placement within the family, within another family member, but then uh, a member of the uh, child's tribe or then uh, a, a family approved by the child's tribe. Um, yeah, okay. Now move on to the Asian American population. So a little, a little bit different information here. You'll see there's only a few slides for here for this group, but um, again, a number of subgroups, 25 subgroups of Asian Americans in the United States. The largest uh, populations come from China, the Philippines, Japan, India, and Asia, Korea, and Vietnam. And Vietnam. The census, the last census identified that Asian Americans were the fastest growing racial group in the United States, increasing by 43% between the last two census, censuses. The discrimination and mistreatment of this population, of course, is uh, egregious history with the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II uh, because there was a fear on the part of the federal government. This was during the uh, Roosevelt administration, Franklin Roosevelt administration, there was a fear that uh, they, they would have more loyalty to the emperor than to the United States. And this was even even individuals who were born and raised in the United States who had never been to Japan. Some of them were veterans from World War I, um, and, and they were gathered up and put in internment camps and held there during the war to keep them from joining the cause of the Japanese. Um, there have been some fears in, in, um, since the uh, Donald Trump campaign in 2016 of, of similar treatment of Muslim Americans in America, although no one's talked about gathering them up. There have been some, some discussions about, you know, requiring them to register and, uh, you know, those kinds of things. And, and um, you know, we, I think, I hope that our society is very careful not to repeat this uh, pattern. Um, that was just so so terrible in in the uh, Second World War. Uh, in 1988, that's uh, more than 40 years after the end of the war, Congress awarded surviving internees twenty thousand dollars. But you know, many of those individuals they they gave up all their they lost their homes, their land, um, they had businesses that that had to close and everything like this, um, and and uh, lost a lot of money, and and a lot of uh, economic standing because of that. The, the larger group of Asian Americans are viewed as a model minority because their income levels are higher, sometimes higher in, in many statistics than white Americans. Their educational attainment is impressive. Um, they have a lot of value in education in, in Asian culture, Eastern cultures. And um, um, and so there there's a lot of effort put into to increasing education. But there are drawbacks to this model minority thing. And, and uh, for one thing, you know, it puts pressure on them to achieve. and in, in academic settings, a lot of times there is some resentment because of the fact that they have such strong performance. There's just a resentment as to their, well, they do so well, I guess people are jealous, I, I suppose. Um, the, the model minority concept sets up some resentment from other minority groups because individuals in the majority can hold Asian Americans up and say, look, you see how this group has done? Why aren't you Hispanic Americans? Why aren't you African Americans? Why aren't you doing the same thing? In Native Americans, you could be doing this too, but you're not. Asian Americans are doing it. And well, there's a number of different uh, factors that are hidden behind the success of the Native, uh, of the Asian Americans. I um, read an article one time that said, you know, for instance, it overlooks the fact that uh, when you look at household incomes, um, many Asian Americans had, uh, you know, a couple of generations three generations even living in one home and so you have the combined incomes of of many different individuals in, in that household um, individuals uh, for instance if if an asian american wants to uh, 
you know, earn a certain amount of money at a certain corporation or whatever. The studies have demonstrated that if it requires a master's degree, if you're a white person to get reset level, it requires a doctorate if you're a if you're Asian American, if, if it requires a bachelor's for a white, it requires a master's for an Asian American, that they have to achieve more, attain more in order to get the same kind of financial rewards that, that white Americans can get. And so that comparative effort is something that's important to keep in mind. And it's really important to kind of look behind this um, model minority um, concept and to see what's really going on there, what's operating there, you know, and in the end, it, it really uh, gives the majority an excuse to um, look past institutional barriers for minority success. But as a group, again, there's, a, you know, a high median family income with great strides in education being made. But um, again, there are certain facts that are concealed here. They tend to oftentimes live in higher in areas where the higher salaries are the norm, uh, higher salary positions are the norm. And so that means you need more money to get by. Um, the other another important factor here, you know, talking about recent immigrants uh, working in low wage sweatshops. And this is another thing that has been pointed out to me in the past that in the history of Asian Americans, it's important for you to, to dis distinguish between those who are immigrating to the United States in this generation or the last generation and those that have been here for several generations because those who have been here for several generations are going to be more well established than recent immigrants. And so the model minority thing where they're doing so well economically isn't the case for recent immigrants at all. They're living very in, in a good bit of poverty as this um, particularly this says Southeast Asians, but any Asians for that matter, are at risk of, of living in poverty because of the f just recent immigration. So it's not just the ethnic group here, but it also has to do with the history of immigration for the individual as well. In general, when you talk about immigration, most immigrants live in these six states that are identified here, but there's a lot of uh, rapid growth in other areas in the United States as well. In 2014, about one in seven or eight of the United States population were foreign born. Now, this includes, uh, well, I, I suppose this includes undocumented immigrants as well as naturalized citizens and those documented immigrants who aren't naturalized yet. Um, and, uh, yes, so the poverty rate for immigrants in general is higher, but those who are naturalized is is at 10 percent it's lower than than the native born citizens uh, at 12 percent immigrants uh, contribute to the economic growth in the 1990s the big boom of the 90s it was talking about how they they uh, um, contributed to our growth by filling an increasing share of jobs by filling jobs in areas where labor was scarce and by taking jobs that american workers did not want again the, the um, idea that, that uh, immigrants, particularly the undocumented workers, are stealing jobs from Americans and taking their income away from us is, is ludicrous. It's really ludicrous. It's just not at all supported by the facts. And, and indeed, um, most studies show that, that uh, immigrants, including undocumented immigrants, uh, are less likely to violate the law than, than uh, citizens are. And um, they're mostly hardworking and taxpaying individuals. But uh, immigrants as a group tend to have, um, well, it says one in three uh, are without high school diplomas. They have less formal education and, and tend to fill these low skilled blue collar service jobs that, uh, you know, that many Americans just don't want. We have a long history of, of accepting and, ex well, if not expelling, at least uh, excluding uh, immigrants, you know, depending upon what the needs of our nation is at the time, you know, if, if during periods of, of growth, like for instance, in the 1800s, we needed railroads built and the, the West was being developed. Oh, we were very happy to take, uh, you know, Chinese and Japanese immigrants. And then once that, uh, that growth had been achieved, the gold rush occurred, suddenly, you know, we began to be less interested in them. By the 1920s, I think, um, certain Asian Americans, Chinese included, Chinese were excluded from immigration. Um, there's been efforts recently, you know, to, to uh, exclude uh, uh, Middle Eastern immigration as well, Muslim immigration. And uh, 
big uh, big concern about immigration from from uh, Central America now. The the caravans, as uh, as President Trump has referred to them. So, but if you look at our history more recently. And during the Reagan administration, the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986 gave legal status to undocumented immigrants who had been in the United States constantly uh, for the last uh, four years or who worked in agriculture. He, he recognized the importance of those agricultural workers and the fact that other Americans didn't want those jobs. Plus, the, the uh, farm owners wanted to keep wages down because if you hire Americans, you're going to be paying more. So um, immigration rose sharply for a few years after that and then, and then dropped off again afterwards. Since the 1950s, uh, the primary source of immigration has shifted from Europe to Asia. And despite the uh, uh, impressions that uh, you know, many Americans have today, the majority of immigrants come from Asia, not from Mexico only, as you can see here. And in fact, it's an interesting statistic that in the last 10 years or so, uh, almost twice as many Mexicans have left the United States as have migrated into it. Two um, particular issues involving younger immigrants, the unaccompanied uh, alien children um, program, I guess, or group, it really uh, kind of um, came into being during the George W. Bush presidency. Um, this, the, this the growing numbers, uh, you know, that uh, of, of these adolescents arriving they're minors but they come on their own from from central american countries honduras and nicaragua and um, there's another country uh, the three of them at least where they're they uh, there's a lot of violence and drug activity and, and parents really are just kind of sending their kids or the kids are leaving wanting to get away from that and trying to have a better life in the united states they arrive here without papers and 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 uh, you know get picked up and they've been being put in detention centers and um, those kinds of things uh, that they're seeking asylum. So there's been some controversy about them uh, during the Trump years, the Trump uh, during the early years of the Trump administration. Then there's the Dreamers. These are the children that have been brought in the United States uh, by their parents who were undocumented workers and who have stayed and who have become a part of American society. Really, no in many respects know nothing of their of their of their uh, countries of origin never lived there never remembered living there um and um th these uh, again the focus of controversy during the trump presidency um there was a path to citizenship uh, proposed by uh, barack obama and many of these kids mind you these young people are in college and um, really you know working hard to to make a better life and um, um, the, the Trump administration has been opposed to the uh, programs that Obama's uh, put up and it's really kind of been using the dreamers uh, have used the dreamers as as um, sort of a bargaining chip in in their efforts to get a wall built uh, finally just a, a few moments uh, about Syrian immigration and Middle Eastern immigration, but primarily Syrian immigration because of the, the civil war that's going on over there and the terrible conditions. There have been refugees uh, leaving Syria and, and going all over Europe and the Middle East, many into other Middle Eastern countries, many into European countries. And uh, in 2015, uh, President Obama approved the admission of 10,000 Syrian refugees, which seemed like, you know, a, kind of a token when you consider you know that literally millions of, of these uh, refugees are looking for asylum in, in the countries in Europe. Uh, I believe Germany alone accepted a one million immigrants uh, of this population, one million refugees. Now there's some talk about all of the, you know, how the immigrants take our benefits. You know, not only they take our jobs, but they're taking benefits if they're not taking our jobs. And the um, Welfare Reform Act really dismantled a lot of. Um, um, well, it, it disentitled legal immig illegal immigrants from um, getting any kind of federal assistance. And, and, um, and some of the states were actually denying Medicaid benefits as well, so that, that they didn't have medical care. Now, some of these uh, provisions were later rescinded, but uh, you know, this, this anti-immigrant sentiment continues, as the textbook points out. And despite um, 
uh, what uh, a lot of people will tell you, illegal immigrants have never been entitled to federal assistance benefits. Uh, they have never had Medicaid coverage. They don't, they're not eligible for Medicare, um, but they do pay taxes. But the, you know, since September 11th, the focus has been on securing the borders and 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 uh, the, this uh, sort of this isolationist kind of attitude has developed, um, where everyone from outside our borders could be a threat. They're, they could be a terrorist, and and um, this has resulted in harassment, and discrimination against immigrants from many different many different countries, uh, both south of the border as well as from as from the Middle East and Africa. Um, Arizona, in particular, has, some, has has implemented some very harsh, uh, very harsh policies regarding immigrants, and uh, you know, some of them have been overturned by the courts. Some of them have not. But uh, the, in the in the larger picture in Europe, you know, the the refugee issue has upended the the uh, political institutions in 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 European nations, as the, all the nations struggle to figure out how to integrate uh, this different culture into into their more staid and traditional culture. You know, it's different in America in that um, America is founded on the concept of, you know, accepting individuals from around the world and everything like that. Germany and France, England are not. They, they are... They have long histories of, you know, relatively insular histories, you know, where where it doesn't necessarily involve people immigrating to their other cultures coming into their country. Now, there's been some exceptions to that, but but uh, by and large, um, they're not set up. Their 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 culture is not set up to welcome outsiders, and so it's been a big struggle for many of those nations to integrate them. And uh, some of the political uh, things like Brexit, for instance, and and uh, the upheaval in in the governments in France and Germany and and different and and Poland, different places around the, uh, Europe, has resulted in part from from the pressures created by the refugee uh, problem in in the Middle East. But the sentiment of the European Union continues to support the notion that immigrants should be integrated and and and. Um, that that uh, really well that that they should be integrated and 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 nonetheless you know the leaders of many of those nations have have indicated that uh, multiculturalism is failing in Europe at the present time. Okay, well that will that will take care of the uh, first part of this week's lecture. So just uh, tune in for the second part here very soon.